All right, guys. Sorry about that. We're uh, we're doing part two. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Technical difficulties. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Steve, we were talking about um, you know the the importance of having braid on your on your reel. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so now with braid, as I was uh, mentioning, uh, it's it's a lot easier to to use like a bait caster style reel that manages your line for you, um, because the capacity level. Uh, significantly increases when you're not fishing monofilament and you're fishing braid. Uh, you can probably get at least four to five times more line on that reel uh, with the same pound test than uh, as monofilament with braid now. So it makes it a lot better. And then also the communication from uh, in the line from a bite travels through braid a lot better because there's no stretch. So I would recommend that um, I personally, you mentioned that you like to do bait casters when you're uh, fishing or line management mm -hmm. uh, reels when you're fishing rockfish. I agree. I, I mean, if I can use a Tranks 500 and with some nice braid on there and uh, and fish rockfish, I, I would totally, you know, reeling in 500 feet of line and not having mm -hmm. to worry about guided with my thumb, I, I would definitely prefer that as well. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, we already talked about, you know, or I guess we were talking about, you know, the fact that with the braid, you can feel every little bump which is really, really, really critical in terms of rock fishing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, rock, yeah, like you mentioned, it's critical with rock fishing. It's critical because uh, they're so far down. And then a lot of, a, a big issue also is a lot of guys are using uh, electric reels, but you're, they don't have, a, I guess they're, uh, they can't gauge how fast they're bringing up that, that fish on an electric reel. Mm -hmm. So a lot of guys will, you know, crank it down and, that fish is coming up way too fast and all it's doing is it's actually spinning mm -hmm. and you end up losing the fish because it just spins off. Um, so uh, the line retrieval with like the bait casters versus the uh, mm -hmm. electric reels is actually better because you have a steady one and as most captains will tell you on sport boats it's all about the steady wine when you're rock fishing. You don't want to crank them up too fast. So, um, so yeah, bait casters um, and then spectra uh, is, uh, is, is critical because you can feel every single bite and you know when you set that hook um, after a bite you know you start reeling them in and, and you have the fish whereas with mono you may not feel the, feel the bite so you may not be able to set the hook. Yeah and you know you kind of said it yourself one of the you know on the occasion that I run boats every now and then one of the most common phrases I use is slow and steady. Yeah. That's all it is slow and steady because Ultimately, if you look at or if you think about it as kind of like an elevator, if you stop in that wind, all that momentum's going up through the water, and that's how most commonly you get your fish lost. Yeah, yep, <laughs> totally agree. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Carrie says, I'm not opposed to a two speed for rock fishing. My arm thanks me at the end of the day. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> uh, very, very true, Carrie, very true. <laughs> Uh, Sean says braid gets the jig or bait down faster using high 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 vis braid high visibility braid helps avoid the tangles especially in low light. That I agree with that. One thing that I forgot to mention with mono, um, it's it's porous, so it actually floats. Mono actually floats. So it uh, if you imagine about what it 500 feet of mono, all that that's actually buoyant. So you're adding buoyancy. To the jig, um, you're re which is basically removing some of that weight from the jig, essentially, in the water. So, braid, whereas braid isn't, you know, it, it's not buoyant. It, it, once it's uh, soaked, it basically just it, it's it'll sink, um, and uh, and it doesn't it cuts through the water a lot better. That's why a lot of guys will use braid. Um, it could just cuts through water, and then it also cuts through kelp. So that's why a lot of guys prefer using braid when they're fishing for calicos and stuff like that over in kelp forest. Um, so yeah, so yeah, I would, I, I totally agree with them. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> Wayne says, remember, you don't have to fish 600 feet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would, that's where all the fun's at. You yeah, know? that's yeah. where the dinosaurs live potentially. <laughs> exactly. I mean, we haven't been able to the opportunity to fish 600 feet in years, and all that ground is kind of uncharted territory exactly so it'll be interesting it'll be interesting uh sean says smaller diameter of braid helps too yep it's very true yep. very true awesome so we're we've already talked about we're going out with the assault jigs we're going with a two-speed reel or a bait caster um what about the rod what would you suggest on a rod 
Uh, I typically use, I mean, I've seen everything used for rock fishing. Um, guys, you know, they make do with what they have. I personally prefer a shorter rod, maybe seven foot, um, medium heavy, medium rod, uh, anywhere from, I don't know, maybe 25 to 40, 30 pound rod. That's typically what I'm, I'm using when I'm rock fishing. And again, I haven't done anything in the 400 feet uh, part, you know, now that it's opened up. So I have no experience there, but typically when we're fishing, uh, you know, 200 feet, 300 feet, like we have in the past, um, that's what works for me. Yeah, something, some, something with a soft tip so you can see the bites is what you, you know, if you're fishing braid, you want something that has a good backbone in case you do get into that heavier lean cod, but you want a soft tip. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's actually a really good point too. You want to see, just as you want to fill it with the braid, you want to see every movement as well. Yeah. Any, uh, any difference there? Um, Carrie said, did not realize mono was buoyant. Makes sense, especially the more like you have out. Yep. Exactly. Absolutely. Um, Wayne says, don't forget your descending d devices, which is absolutely oh, true. Yeah. Yeah. Now with this whole thing is we want to make sure that we follow all the regulations. It's very rare that they give us something back after taking it away. So one thing that I want to kind of recommend is every boat that plans on fishing that heavy, uh, that deeper stuff, you want to have a descending device. So if you do happen to hook a yellow eye or a cow cod, you know, something that's protected, we want to make sure to get that fish back in the water and back to its zone uh, safely. And, and, and that uh, descending device is what's going to do it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, a, like a landing net, you always want to have a descending device too when you're going rock yeah. fishing. Really, really important. And uh, most sport boats should be having them as well. So uh, if you're, uh, and most, po more sp mo in my experience, most sport boats actually will have a designated crew guy to actually be the descender. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Nice. Yeah, at least in my experience. Nice. Uh, Carrie says, more line you have out, not like. Yeah, I, I get it. <laughs> awesome, awesome. So very cool. We've gone over rock fishing. What about, you know, you've mentioned we have about, I don't know, maybe a couple of days or a week left in lobster fishing. You know, late season, obviously. What are what are your tips and tricks to go uh, for lobster fishing this time of year? So I prefer fishing this time of the year for okay. lobster fishing because there's not as many guys out there. But then, again, over the past few years, everyone's kind of key, uh, realized that towards the end of the season, uh, the lobsters come back. Um, they go down deep uh, midway through the season and as later in the season they come back to the shallows is what I've found. Um, so during this time of the year I usually don't have to go so deep. I won't have to pull so much um, and I'm still have and I can potentially have good nights. Um, so I would recommend uh, just little tips and tricks is finding you know good structure you want good current. It, you can consider lobsters very similar to calico bass. You know, when you're fishing calico bass, um, and I've learned this from one of our pro staffers, Gil Hernandez, he preaches that when you're going out lobster fishing, the characteristics that you're looking for are similar to the calico bass. You want good current, you want good bait food, and then you want structure, which is essentially um, calico bass. You know, when you go out fishing uh, uh, and you're driving out in the channel and you see all these buoys from the commercial guys they're usually settled up on wrecks and stuff like that to similar areas that you would fish calico bass so mm -hmm. you want those same characteristics so um, look for those uh, and then as I mentioned before during this time of the year they're a little bit shallower so I would I would typically not fish deeper than 80 feet um, you can I mean I'm not saying that they're not there uh, they could be um, but typically, I personally will fish a little bit shallower during this time of the year, dur during the end of the year, uh, end of the season. Um, and I've had good luck doing it. Um, Palos Verdes area, uh, Catalina area, the front side of Catalina, obviously, is always really good uh, for me during this time of the year. And like I mentioned before, there's not as many boats out there. So a lot of guys have already, sad to say, put their gear away for the season. Um, uh, so you don't have to worry about the traffic. You don't have to worry about, you know, getting out a little bit later because you have to take care of work or whatever and uh, somebody's sitting on your spot. Lots of times during this time of the year, you know, you're the only boat out there, which is totally awesome. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so don't be afraid to go out during this time of the year. I know a lot of people think that, you know, it's over, but it, you'd be surprised at how good the fishing is during this time of the year. There's less pressure. Um, uh, the water 
you know, this year is a little bit rare, but typically for the past few years, it's been a little bit warmer. So there's a little bit more bait in the water, which means they're a little bit shallower. Um, um, and then also during the summer of the year, you'll see a lot of the females uh, with eggs on, on them. So, um, so they're typically in shallower water too, because of that reason after the, the mating, they come up to feed. Um, so, so yeah, so I would say, you know, don't count it out yet. It's, mm -hmm. it's definitely, for me, it's been one of the better times of the season towards the end. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah we were just talking to Ryan from Slade SoCal a couple of weeks ago, and, uh, I want to say it was him. He usually, you can find him usually fishing up against the jetties out there and all that structure, basically, yep. especially this time of year. Yeah. Yeah. Like I mentioned, shallow, you don't have to go, you, you know, super deep you don't need a puller which is always fun i prefer doing it without a puller because that's that takes all the fun out of it yeah um uh so you can go shallow um and then uh yeah anywhere where there's structure that's the number one thing structure and current and you want to make sure to have good bait but jetties um, rock piles wrecks uh you know just natural reefs and anything artificial reefs um anything that's structure where they that has pockets and holes where they can hide during the day and then come out and feed that's what you want that's where you want to put your you know situate your your hoop nets around and uh and then always keep an eye on the current you obviously always want to be on the top side of the current to where it's pushing that bait scent into those rocks where they're hiding um that way you know they they get the scent and then they always try and go to the source of that food that scent um, so you always want to be on the upside of that current and then have that current carry that scent down. You never want to be on the downside because the scent is basically going away from them. You're not going to get them. That's, so. that's not the point. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Wayne says, any recommendations for targeting rock crab with our lobster nets? Rock crab. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I, I do it all. When I do target rock crab specifically, it'll be uh, in the Santa Monica Bay area. Um, any, same thing, basically, structure. Um, if you can find structure right along um, sandy edges, sandy areas, um, dropping it on that sand. Well, you always want to drop it on the sand. You don't want to drop it right on the uh, structure because then you'll get your net uh, snagged up. But more so for targeting crab, uh, I found that um, if you can find those areas where it's very sandy and then the structure right alongside, um, you, you potentially have good, good luck with crab and rock crab. And it's the same thing, um, same bait, you know, your mackerel, your sardines. I prefer using fresh bait. I, I hardly, unless it's like, you know, a last minute trip and I can't go out and make bait, I prefer using fresh bait. I'll go to the receiver and buy bait. I'll go fishing during the day and whatever bait I have left over, that's what I'll use that night for lobster fishing. I don't like using frozen bait. Uh, it's just a personal preference. I know guys that use it and have great luck with it, but me personally, I prefer using the freshest stuff that I can. Um, but it's a ba basically the same concept for crabbing, uh, crab fishing. Um, um, you know, just find that structure, find the, the, the nice sandy bottom to put that net on, and uh, and good bait. And uh, and you should, you know, it's not rare to catch lobster and crab at the same time. You know, lots of times when these guys are going out and they're pulling their net, they got a nice fat lobster and then a couple, couple crab in there also. So, basically the same 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 uh general rules of thumb i think for for both crab and lobster excellent yeah excellent uh sean says crabbing when lobster season is closed is good homework for lobster season yep <laughs> exactly as long as you're not keeping any lobster on the boat those those lobster need to go right in back into the water once that net comes to the surface uh then you're good i mean uh, crab is open year round guys so um not a lot of guys do it but those it's open year round so you guys can use your hoop nets um and like like our like was it sean sean yeah like sean mentioned uh it's a good way to do your homework and figure out where that structure finding good structure um finding potential areas for that lobster season um crabbing you know crabbing can help you do that yeah good practice good practice uh carrie wants to know what do you consider a long soak time so by law, you can't do anything longer than two hours for, for lobster fishing. So you can't have your hoop net uh, in the water um, for longer than two hours. After that, if a DFW comes, he considers it as an abandoned hoop net and they can confiscate it or, you know, you don't want to keep your hoop net in there for, for more than two hours. So typically, I mean, I've heard everything from 15 minutes to almost two hours. Uh, when I go out, you know, it, 
30 minutes is probably what I do consistently. Sometimes it'll be a little bit more, but because I'm making the round or cycling through everything. So if I'm fishing 10 hoop nets, by the time I, uh, af you know, by the time I get to the 10th one, it's already time to, it's been 45 minutes since I did that first one. Mm -hmm. So it's already time to pull it. And I just cycle through them. And, um, and with our, um, our LED light sticks, it makes it really easy to keep track of which ones you've pulled and which ones you haven't, because there's two settings. There's a flashing setting and then a solid setting. So once you start pulling you know, the first batch of them up, you can have, start them off with solid lights. So by the time you get to the 10th solid light one, you've set that one, you go back to the first one to pull it, pull it out, and you can turn that light to flashing mode. And now you know, okay, that one I already pulled, I can you know, move down the line and keep going and then just basically alternate them through all the, throughout the cycles. That makes it really easy as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you kind of brought up a good point where um, you, know, you do have the light sticks yeah, as we, well. We, for lobster, lobstering specifically, we have pretty much every single component that you would need to go out hooping. We have the hoop nets, obviously, the bait cages, the rope, the floats, the light sticks, the line weights, uh, the bait cage snaps. Um, every single component that you would need for lobster hooping, we, we have. So we've, um, everyone at the company, uh, lobster hoops, we all do it. So it's, it's fisher, it's all this stuff is designed by fishermen for fishermen. So we take, we take pride in everything that we do and, and we feel confident that everything that we develop is going to, is going to do what it's designed to do basically, because we put it through the trials and tribulations. Yeah, so. that, that's a really good point there. And also, I, uh, before I forget, we do have to recognize lobster season's coming to a close here pretty soon. Make sure you're turning your report cards. Oh, that's correct. You have to do it by April. April, yes. Yeah, make sure you guys, and now they make it really easy. Before you had to mail it in, mm -hmm. um, and now you can just go online and fill it out. You don't even have to send your card in. You just go online, fill in the dates that you went, fill out the information, click send, and you're good. So yeah. and, and if you don't do it, they it's tack on they tack <laughs> on the fine next year when you're going out to get your lobster card for that next season they tack on that fine so your lobster card is no longer uh, the fee that it's supposed to be it's you know more expensive yeah, yeah. absolutely uh, Gilbert's shining in he says 45 to 60 minutes which is about right yeah, yeah. soak time uh, Wayne actually popped a uh, a link down to Promar's website down below so make sure you definitely go check them Thanks, out Wayne I appreciate it yeah and uh, he also mentions that you offer the gloves and the headlamps and basically every aspect you need for lobster yeah, fishing. Yeah, we offer a few different styles of gloves. We have everything from your uh, latex palm grip glove, which you see most of the guys using, um, to a nice insulated thick uh, rubber glove to, you know, if you're out there and it's a cold night, um, you stay nice and comfortable with them. So yeah, we, we offer, when it comes to lobstering guys, we have every single item that you could think of. Um, Wayne uh, very nicely attached the link down at the bottom. So check out all our stuff on our website. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact us. Excellent. Uh, Carrie asks, white nav lights for kayaks, question mark. I'm guessing that's a kayak question. White na nav lights? Yeah. Like oh, a so yeah. So if you're on a kayak and you're fishing at night, you have to have some type of light so that people can identify. You can see you out there. Boaters can see you out there. It's a safety thing. Um, so you do have to have a white light. Most guys, when I'm out there on my boat, I see them wearing headlamps, um, or some of them will actually have one of those uh, lights on a, I guess they're designed specifically for kayaks. You can just put them in a rod holder. It's a stick and it has a light at the top. But yeah, if you're out there at night, um, you are doing you know, lobster hooping at night, so it can, it, can, it can be sketchy, but as long as you take all the right precautions, it, it's it's a fun night, and uh, if you're kayaking, you want to make sure you have a white light, whether it's a Promar headlamp or, like I mentioned, a fixed uh, light stick on your kayak. You you want to have some type of light to for boaters to, to be able to see you. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, you know, as we wrap up, uh, we definitely have a little bit more time for your questions, so make sure you pop them in the comments below. But Steve, you know, we're almost two months into 2021. Anything exciting planned for you? Um, just more fishing, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, last year, I, I mean, we were just talking about how once we get into the fishing industry, it becomes a lot harder to actually fish. <laughs> yeah. We get into the fishing industry thinking, oh, you know, we're going to be fishing, you know, we're going to be doing mm -hmm. all this cool, these cool 
product testing trips and mm -hmm. usually the product goes to the pro staff guys and they're the ones using it and the guys that work for the company uh, just basically do all the, the office work and you know <laughs> the boring side of it yeah. but yeah I every year you know I tell myself I'm gonna fish more this year so this year I think I'm, I'm gonna really make it um, a priority to try and get out on the water a little bit more and uh, and yeah I mean uh, if I if I can fish you know one day a month I'll be I'll be extremely happy compared to what I've been doing the past <laughs> couple of years yeah excellent excellent um, Gilbert actually brings up a good point any uh, tutorial vi videos on your website or anything that we can look yeah at? we have a, a huge library uh, on YouTube if you just got uh, if you go on YouTube search Promar and Ahi USA um, we have a variety of, uh, of tutorial videos from all of our pro staffs to um, some of the guys that were working, some boat captains as well. I know Jared, uh, Jared Malott did one uh, going through rock fishing and all the tips and tricks that you would need if you're going on a sport boat. So we do have a huge library um, for, for you guys to check out uh, YouTube and then also on our website as well. It'll, it'll shoot you the, the link and directory on there as well. Uh, and that's Promar Ahi dot com or promarnets.com or ahiusa.com all of those work i was just about to ask you where do we go and get all the get geared up before the season <laughs> all those websites Promar, yeah all those <laughs> websites promarahiusa.com excellent uh carrie has one question does the kayak light need to be a 360 light yeah so i think it does um and uh, i think it it falls under the same as like if you were have if you had like a, a 12 foot skiff I, I just know based on experience, I used to have a 14-foot skiff, aluminum skiff that I would go out in the harbor, and you were required to have a 360 dome light. Um, I don't think kayaks uh, are required to have the, the nav lights, the green and red. I'm not 100% sure on that, so don't quote me. Um, contact uh, Coast Guard or visit the Coast Guard website, and they'll be able to tell you, but I know kayaks have to have that 360 white dome light. Um, on there on on them. I believe it's a, it has to be a three. I know it has to be a light They have to have a light at night I'm not a hundred percent sure if it's, it has to be 360, but I imagine it, it'd be safer So I would I would do a 360 exactly. Yeah, exactly I you know honestly based off experience. I don't see too many kayaks with the red and the green starboard and yeah. port. Um, I don't think it's necessary, but like like Steve said check with the Coast Guard Those are the best guys to talk to yeah. um, Wayne also says can't wait for iCast <laughs> yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I cast, you know, it's as Davey mentioned earlier, usually when we go to these trade shows, we, we, you know, hang out with our friends from other companies. We, you know, talk about fishing. We do some fishing. Usually these are these the trade shows are usually the only time of year where us, you know, guys in the industry get to stray away and do do some fishing. So um, I cast is definitely a place where where we look forward to that because there's water everywhere in Orlando that and every little pond has bass in it so we look forward to going there because we like to bass fish <laughs> <laughs> absolutely absolutely uh, Wayne said Coast Guard asked kayaks to not have red green nav lights as they are not motorized vessels there you go bingo yeah bingo awesome and uh, one more thing Steve I know you've got a pretty exciting project on the side there you're kind of the producer of the Phil Friedman podcast yeah yeah so I <laughs> me and uh, Phil Friedman you guys may know is the voice of uh, SoCal sport fishing he uh, started 976 tuna um, we recently partnered in doing a podcast so we uh, we feature local so uh, SoCal um, charter captains we do industry guys we do um, just any any anyone that's involved in sport fat, sport fishing in SoCal, um, we have these guys on. We talk we we talk with them. They share insights. They share tips, fishing tips. Um, give a little bit of history of, of their involvement in the industry. Just really really good stuff. And I think any anyone that fishes in SoCal would would appreciate it. Um, and we're available on YouTube, um, social media, uh, on podcast on the Apple Podcast app, Spotify, Stitcher. All the good, you know, the well-known apps, and that's Friedman Adventures. Yeah. yeah, and guys, it's definitely worth a listen or a watch on YouTube. I know they've had some really, really powerful episodes as of late, which definitely worth a listen. Yeah. Definitely worth a listen. Check them out. Well, Steve, I can't thank you enough, man. I can't believe the hour's already gone <laughs> by. Um, again, apologies for the technical difficulties. I know we had two different broadcasts, but, um, you know, it is what it is, technology sometimes. Yep. But, uh, Steve, like I said, I can't thank you enough for, uh, well, for having me 
We're in the uh, beautiful Promar studio, which is awesome. No, we appreciate you guys coming down and uh, having us on. This is awesome. Absolutely, absolutely. One more time for everyone out there. Where do we uh, go uh, get geared up from Promar and Ahi? So we have three uh, current websites. You can do promarahi.com, promarnets.com, or ahiusa.com. And, you know, they're all linked together, so you can find all the information on any one of those. Excellent, and excellent. And also so, so, uh, Facebook, Instagram, we're on all that as well. Awesome. Yeah. And like I said before, we can't thank you enough for being a sponsor of CCA Cal. Definitely yeah. appreciate we, it. We love helping you guys <laughs> out in any way we can. Excellent, excellent. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. My name is Chris from CCA. This is Steve from Promar. We will see you guys next week. Take care, guys. Thanks, guys.